Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Amma ba'd. Alhamdulillah, we are in the final week. It's hard to believe the final week is here. This is the sixth, seventh out of eight sessions. So today and tomorrow, inshallah, we expect to wrap this up. And if Allah wills, continue the journey in the fall. So today we want to begin by looking at some stats about Imam al-Bukhari's teachers. Okay, um, this is a discussion we started in the prior week, and we're just going to continue. Um, okay. So as we mentioned, what did we say? We said that um, Imam al-Bukhari had 1,080 teachers in total. Okay, online students, please mute your mic. So he had 1,080 teachers, and out of his teachers, he was very selective. So one of the things about Imam al-Bukhari is that he's highly selective um, for various reasons. So it's not that he just takes everything or a particular person that he likes, but he deems him... Um, Trustworthy, he'll take everything that he says, but even with trustworthy people will be selective uh, from his own teachers. He learned from many people, but then he was selective. So he used 321 of his teachers uh, for his Sahih. So he used the reports of 321 of his teachers and 20 of them he used in more than 50% of the book. So the number is not that daunting. If you really want to know the history, um, and want to decipher where Imam al-Bukhari's source of knowledge is coming from in terms of his isnad. There are 20 major teachers from whom more than half of the Sahih is transmitted. So on the screen here, you have the names. So I'll just run by the names. I'm not doing a biography of these teachers. We're going to do the biographies as we cover hadith by hadith. So some of them we did cover already. So I just want to read out the names for you. These are the 20 teachers of Imam al-Bukhari, who, from whom he takes the majority of his book, more than 50% of his book. So number one is Musaddad ibn Sar Musarhad, Musaddad. Number two, Abdullah bin Yusuf at tinisi So he was, in, he was a teacher from Hadith number two. So we covered his biography. He was a student of Imam Malik, teacher of uh, great... Hadith expert of Medina. Number three, Qutayba ibn Sa'id of Balkh. Number four, Ali ibn al-Madini, who is perhaps Imam Bukhari's favorite teacher. Number five, Abu al-Yaman. Abu al-Yaman will be the next hadith tomorrow. The final hadith of this chapter um, is related through him. Number six, Musa ibn Ismail. Number seven, Yahya ibn Bukair. Yahya ibn Bukair we saw last week, so we covered his biography already. Number eight, Muhammad ibn Bashar, also known as Bundar. Uh, number nine, Adam ibn Iyas. Number 10, Ismail ibn Abi Uwais. Ismail was a son-in-law of Imam Malik, and he was the one who laced the muwatta from Imam Malik to Imam al-Bukhari. Number 11, Abdullah ibn Muhammad al-Musnadi. Number 12, Abu Nu'aym al-Fadl. Ibn al-Dukain, so Abu Nu'aym for short. Abu Nu'aym is a famous teacher that Imam Ahmad and Yahya ibn Ma'in were returning from a journey and they went and they tried to trick him to suggest his memory and he wound up kicking Yahya ibn Ma'in. So that was a great teacher, Abu Nu'aym. Suleiman ibn Harb, number 13. Number 14, Al-Qa'nabi. Number 15, Abu Al-Walid, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. Number 16, Abdul Aziz ibn, Abdullah, ibn Abdullah. Number 17, Abdan, whose name was Abdullah ibn Uthman. We're going to look at him today. Number 18, Ishaq ibn Rahaway. Number 19, Muhammad ibn al Muthanna. And number 20, Muhammad ibn Salam. So these are the 20 prolific teachers of Imam al Bukhari, from whom he relates the majority of his Sahih. Now, there is a discussion we want to have, um, moving on to a separate discussion, and that is 
The discussion, what is the most authentic book? Is it Bukhari, is it Muslim, or is it some other book, the Muatta? These are the three contenders in our history for uh, what is the most authentic book of Hadith that exists. Um, of course, we keep mentioning, coming back to Sahih al-Bukhari, and for sure, um, a strong opinion is this is the most sound book of Hadith, but you have to be aware that there are other dissenting opinions, and not all of them are incorrect. All of them have some merit. So there's a lot of discussion about Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. So Imam Muslim, for instance, many people considered... Um, so, so, well, let me, let me backtrack. Imam al-Shafari said that Tahta Adim is Sama, under the canopy of the sky, there is no sounder book than the Muwatta of Imam Malik. So Imam al-Shafri is talking about his own teacher, the Muwatta of Imam Malik. So that's Imam Shafri's opinion. And many scholars held that view that the Muwatta is the soundest book. Um, Abu Ali and Naysapuri, he said there is no sounder book under the sky than Imam Muslim Sahih. And many scholars of the Maghrib. North Africa, their opinion was the same. Um, so how do we reconcile all of this? Um, first, how can you reconcile Imam Shafari's statement? Anyone have ideas? Imam Shafari, um, he said that the Muatta is the soundest book. What would you say about that? Is this a difference of opinion or? Years before Imam Bukhari? Yeah, exactly. So you have to know your history. He lived way before Imam al Bukhari. So, of course, Bukhari wasn't authored in his lifetime. So, at that time, for surely, Imam Shafari was right. The Muatta was the soundest book of Hadith. And remember, I shared with you perspective that the Muatta, the, or the Sahih of Imam al Bukhari, a Muslim, represents a continuation of the same project of the Muatta. So, it's a continuation of that same work. So the Muatta is the asl, the source, and Bukhari and Muslim are emanations of that source. That's how Shah Wadiullah saw it. So in that sense, this statement is not outlandish. It makes perfect sense. But you have to keep in mind the nuances, which is that the Muatta is not just a book of hadith. It contains many non-prophetic reports from Omar, from Ali, from the teachers of Imam Malik. So it contains much more than hadith. But if you just eliminate all that material and just look at the hadith, then the Muatta is fairly sound. It's one of the soundest books. But the majority of it is in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari anyway. Okay. Um, there's a statement of Abu Ali. So I already shared that statement, uh, that Imam Muslim's book is the uh, most Sahih. So Ibn Hajar does an analysis. What I have on the screen here is, is a statistical analysis that Ibn Hajar Shares. Ibn Hajar's view is, no, Bukhari is the soundest book, and it takes precedence over Imam Muslim's work, um, without a doubt, for in his mind at least. So he presents some research, so there are many ways of looking at it, because these are sophisticated books, right? There's a primary corpus, secondary corpus, there's supporting reports. So when you keep all that in mind, when you compare books, like sometimes you're comparing apples and oranges, so you really have to be honest and academic and know, okay, what are we talking about? Like, you have to fine-tune it further. So you can't just make a blanket statement like that. You have to kind of qualify it. Um, so what does he say? Um, he says, okay, if you look at, so Ibn Hajar analyzes um, all the reporters that have been criticized. So Imam Bukhari and Muslim, they share, you know, reports from many isnads, from many reporters. And Generally speaking, all of them, most of them are undisputed. Everyone recognizes their authenticity, their trustworthiness, their thiqahness. Um, but there's always a difference of opinion. So even in Bukhari, Muslim, and the early works, there are always differences of opinion. So if you ask all the experts of hadith, there will be dissenting views on um, their opinions on specific narrators and also specific reports. So Ibn Hajar, he says, if you look at uh, in Bukhari, for instance, how many reports are, um, okay, so this is how he looked at it. There are many reporters that are both Bukhari and Muslim. So he eliminated those, okay, that's the same for both. So he looked at Bukhari exclusive reporters and Muslim exclusive reporters. What does that mean? That means those 
reporters that are only in Bukhari and Muslim does not take them. They're unique to Bukhari. And when I say unique to Bukhari, unique to his book, his Sahih. And then those reporters that Imam Muslim accepted, like teachers and even people higher up, that Imam Bukhari did not accept. So then if he, he, he did a statistical analysis of those two. So Bukhari has 430 in the first column, um, exclusive reporters that Muslim did not have. And Muslim had 620 reporters that Bukhari did not have. Ruat. Okay. And then Imam Ibn Hajar says, let me look at how many of those were criticized or disputed by other people. So there are people out there, they say, no, well, this one is not sound, or his, his accuracy was compromised, or his adala was compromised, and so on and so forth. So among Bukhari exclusive reporters, 80 Ibn Hajar found to be criticized. That represents about 18% of that content. And among Imam Muslims reporters, 160 have been criticized. So that represents about 25% of the content. So in other words, we can say, if you look at it from this perspective, 18% of those reporters that only Bukhari took were criticized, but 25% of those reporters that only Muslim took were criticized. So Bukhari wins out from this particular analysis. It's 18 versus 25. No? Why not? I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, but it's a percentage, right? So the, he's comparing the percentages. So you're thinking error rate? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's of course it's not an exact number. Let me put the the errors. You mean? Yeah, but Imam, Imam Ahmad did not mean to compile any Sahih reports. So if there are people criticized, it doesn't matter because his work is represents a different animal. So, I mean, so the numbers, okay, so you can conclude what you may. So the numbers are kind of small, right? 80 out of 430. So you can say there's a lot of error, margin of error here. So you're not convinced. Perfectly fine. Also, um, the 18 versus 25 is not a huge difference, right? It's not like 80% versus 10%. So um, this is Ibn Hajar's analysis. Take it or leave it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's differences of opinion, right? So there could be differences of opinions for sure. There are many examples of differences of opinion for sure. Yeah, I gotta charge this some more. So anyway, um, hang on. Where did my so this is Ibn Hajar's analysis? Um, I mean, I just shared with you one one stat. Like he has a whole uh, discussion on why Bukhari is superior to Muslim. So he looks at it from this perspective. Also, he looks at it from another perspective. He says, okay, who were the reporters? Okay, the reporters that were disputed in Bukhari, those 80, how did Bukhari use them? And those reporters that are disputed in Muslim, this makes more sense. How did Muslim use them? So Muslim, when he used these 160 reporters, he used all their hadith, basically. Like, so if these reporters, he accepts them, he, he puts all their hadith in the chapter or wherever they belong. Um, in the specific chapter. Bukhari is highly selective. Even among his disputed reporters, he doesn't take most of their reports. So he picks and chooses from the disputed reporters. So Imam Ibn Hajar thinks, um, and many scholars would agree, that he was scrutinizing and analyzing on a case-by-case -case basis. So be, the fact that he was more selective in his use of disputed, disputed reporters shows that he had more acumen. So for him, that's more authentic, yeah. So yeah, so assuming that it's from the main corpus. Now, however, um, well, I'll get to that. Um, 
So Ibn Hajar then makes another comment that, okay, from the perspective of Isnad integrity, and I didn't put that on the screen, but so this, this um, many scholars don't agree with, but he says there's another factor that proves Bukhari's superiority of a Muslim. So he, he's listing various factors, right? So he says that Bukhari's conditions are more strict. So he says, for instance, and this is a well-known like, um, or, or famously articulated difference between Bukhari and Muslim, um, and that is that Imam Bukhari believed that you had to have proof of meeting, thubutul liqa, between reporters. And Muslim, for him, the two reporters that, you're, that are in the isnad on top of each other, or one on top of the other, it's enough for them to be contemporaries from the same generation, Mu'asara. So for Muslim, um, he didn't investigate um, as long as, okay, they roughly, they could have met, he assumed that they did meet. For Imam Bukhari, he needed proof that they met. That's the difference. However, this has been debunked. Uh, the, the fact is that there's no such difference between Bukhari and Muslim. They had the same exact conditions. And that is that, you know, if there's a red flag, then they would investigate. If there's a red flag that this person did not meet this person based on other evidences, then they would investigate. But otherwise, you presume that they did meet when you're comparing this macro or doing this macro analysis of Isnads. So that macro analysis of Isnad is enough to uncover problems like this, like someone who didn't meet someone. But looking for every single person some physical or, or proof, historical proof that they met the other person that's unrealistic and um, it's not something that Imam Bukhari stipulated. So Ibn Hajar says God knows best at the end of the chapter. Um, you know, so this, this you can, has been disputed, heavily disputed. Um, and this is the famous, remember I said that there is a um, criticism in the Muqaddimah of Imam Muslim Sahih where the words are quite harsh that the ones who stipulated this positive evidence of meeting like don't know what they're talking about basically and he was talking about Bukhari that's what the common knowledge is but it's not that uh, it's not the case because they are on the same wavelength they have the same conditions and finally Ibn Hajar goes on and on but he says um, looking at the reports with hidden defect there are a number of hadith even in the Sahihain that might have some potential hidden defects, illa. And he said um, 210 reports have been criticized um, in the Sahihain, 210 that might have hidden defects. 80 of them are in Bukhari, and the rest are in Muslim. So there are more potential defective reports in Muslim than there are in Bukhari. This is one way of looking at it, um, you know, so if, for that, if you look at this statistical analysis, then Bukhari wins out. Um, another perspective is that they're pretty much equivalent. So any questions on that? Yeah. yeah, so he's just looking at the criticize. He's not saying whether they're right or not. So that's, you know, so he's just going by rough stats, right? Like, so most of these cases, when you look at the criticism, they're probably not, they're without merit or you know but just the fact that someone's been criticized just looking at how many people have been criticized or disputed so that's a good point so in the end you know um which book is more sound yes sir uh, shahab bhai no it's about the people so this this analysis is about the people the people have been criticized those people in the chain the rawis this is not about the Rawis. Um, what's 210 minus 80? I'm bad with math now. 130. 130? One what? 130? Okay. So there are 130 potentially defective reports in Sahih Muslim and 80 in um, Imam Bukhari Sahih. Um, however, as Brother Ramjan mentioned, are these in the primary court? That's the key question. So now the problem is most of, and I had a discussion with Shaykh Akram today, let's think about this issue, sometimes I call him, discuss things. Um, 
So he says, because he, he just finished a major commentary on Sahih Muslim and is going to the press. He spent the last like decade writing that. Um, so he said basically all those, these disputed reporters and the disputed reports in Sahih Muslim almost entirely are in his supporting corpus, not the primary corpus. I mean, even Ibn Hajar wasn't able to have the nuanced way of looking at, okay, which ones are we talking about? And he says, Shaykh Akram says that the primary corpus, the usul of Sahih Muslim, it's very rare to have criticized reporters. Um, Muslim, we're talking about Muslim. Because here, the, the point here is that Muslim has more criticized reporters, but most of these criticized reporters are actually in the secondary corpus, in the supporting reports, the mutaba'at and the shawahid. Um, so, Shaykh Akram says, from that perspective, if you go by these numbers and Muslim ones up, then most of the, or many of the criticized reporters in Bukhari's are in his primary corpus. So, you know, these numbers are just scholarly uh, stats and uh, trying to come up with like which one wins. But in the end of the day, so Shaykh Akram's view is that the primary corpus of Sahih Muslim is more sound than the primary corpus of Sahih Bukhari. So he has an article on that that I translated a couple of years ago. So I, that's why I called him. I was like, do you still stick to that opinion? He, in that article, he wrote, Sahih Muslim is sounder than Sahih Bukhari from one perspective. When looking at it, just like number of criticized reporters and just a primary corpus, if you eliminate everything else. So he said he maintained today that, yes, he still maintains that. Um, but they're both fully authentic. Sahih Bukhari is the primary corpus is fully sound. So is Sahih Muslim. But the issue is that both were written slightly differently with different perspectives in mind. So, um, so Sahih Muslim is a classical book of hadith. And Husna Sana'a has perfect craft, craftsmanship. So what he did is, and every topic gathered the, the strongest hadith on that topic, the usul, he put them first, and then he put like supporting reports after that, and sometimes weak reports after that. So there's this clear structure and gradation. So in that sense, the primary corpus of Sahih Muslim is cleaner. It contains only like authentic reports and the best in each field. Imam Bukhari, what he does is, He's all over the place because he has different vision. He's giving you a primary corpus that's highly authentic, but he's trying to give you a vision of what the sunnah is and trying to derive as much benefit as he can from multiple hadith. So he's sharing hadith all over the book in various chapters. In Sahih Muslim, you will find the hadith only in one chapter where it belongs in the classical sense. So because there's different vision of Bukhari, and Bukhari is bolder, he has slightly, like, he has more boldness and more courage in order to investigate like reporters and reports that are potentially problematic so he'll investigate and if he thinks well yeah everyone disagreed everyone called this reporter weak but when i look at this particular report of this reporter um he like in his research it's uh, sound for him so he uses it so when people don't understand that then you know uh it's not that cut and dry then people misunderstand what he's doing so Bukhari has slightly different methodology, although basically they have the same criteria, they have the same conditions. Um, they both accept the same primary reports in each chapter, but Bukhari is trying to do more with the work. Because of that, in that sense, sometimes he'll use reporters that are slightly weaker in the primary corpus, but the hadith is fully sound. He'll never use a hadith or a report that's not sound, but he will report use reporters sometimes that are relating a sound hadith, but they might be weaker because he's certain that they said uh, or their uh, this particular report is sound and established from the Prophet So he has different perspectives in mind. Imam Muslim would not do that. And also the difference between Adala and Dabt that we alluded to last week, that for Muslim, the moral criteria is very uh, very, very important. So anyone had slight innovation or bidar, he would leave that reporter, not touch his reports. Imam Bukhari, he would wanna not want to miss out on any sunnah. He would investigate his reports and sometimes be willing to use them, uh, specific reports of theirs. Okay. Allahu alam. Yes, go ahead, Ram John. Yeah, he, he does that. So... 
So Bukhari, for instance, uses weaker isnads of strong reports sometimes for a purpose. Um, so he doesn't want to repeat the same isnads every single time. So he reports a hadith or he repeats a hadith multiple times. Every time he repeats a hadith, sometimes he'll bring a different isnad in order to bring some isnad points out in order for other benefits. And so he's not afraid to use weaker reporters. Muslim will not. Muslim will only do... Um, you know, in the secondary corpus. Yeah, for sure. Sure, sure. So these numbers are, this is Ibn Hajar's analysis. That's why I preface this to say, now scholars today are free to make their own analysis. Also, there's there's huge difference in like, how do you count hadith? Like last week's hadith, remember I had a supporting, it's not, is that one or two? So today I'm putting on like the notes that we're doing hadith number six, today six. But the last week, like that was just one, but it's listed as three and four in many books. So even though at the end, it's not a separate hadith, it's just a different isnad. Yeah, so, so it's numbered differently there too. Yeah, yeah, three and four. So also depends how you number, like sometimes the defect might be in two reports and you could count them as separate versus one. So that number is very, it's very subjective. You just have to in the end qualify what you're doing what is your research? Present your research in a proper way. Um, and research is research. But in the end, my, our conclusion is that Imam Bukhari and Muslim, both of them are the soundest books of hadith out there. They're um, roughly are part of the same project. They have the same criteria um, with slight nuances and differences that represent differences of expert. There's a bulk of material that's the same in Bukhari and Muslim that's agreed upon, it's called muttafaqun ali. So when you have material like that, those hadith are undisputable. They're the highest level, hadith that's in Bukhari and Muslim. But then those hadith that are only in Bukhari or only in Muslim, they're also very sound, but you can put them at like one tier below that primary tier. Um, so in the end, these are great books, but we're studying Sahih al-Bukhari and you have to understand um, how they relate to other books. When you compare this to the Jami' al-Tirmidhi, or you compare it to the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, or you compare it to the Muatta of Imam Malik, they're all different books with different purposes in mind. So you can't compare apples and oranges. So you have to kind of be more uh, sophisticated in your analysis. Because people ask all the time, okay, why did Tirmidhi put this book, hadith in his book? Because he wasn't doing the same thing that Bukhari was doing with his book. Neither was Imam Ahmad. Imam Ahmad wasn't compiling a book of Sahih Hadith. It's a book of all Hadith. Um, so everyone has a different vision. When you read a book, you have to know the author's voice. You have to understand what the author is trying to do, and that's how you can understand him better. You can free to agree and disagree. It's very, very important. Don't bring your own um, vision of what you think the book should have, but understand what the author is doing. Uh, wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Any final questions before we break from Maghrib? Ramjan? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the historical critical method, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, so in Hadith 101, 102, that's why we spent two semesters building that base. That base is that. For Muslim scholars, they have this really sophisticated, sophisticated methodology of five um, tiers of cri five uh, criterion that um, determine whether a report is sound, and they were looking at it from their own epistemological lens. Allah alam. Let's take a break, online students. Fifteen minute break. Uh, we'll come back and resume, inshallah. Pause the recording. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Let's switch gears a bit um, to the biography of Imam al-Bukhari. Now, there's so much to cover. I'm just going to do as much as I can, um, knowing that we won't be able to cover everything. But Bukhari's uh, scholarship was very unique and very different. So I want to talk about that and talk about his memory today. Um, so he used to, in his autobiographical details and various works, he used to say himself that I didn't write hadith like other people. 
whenever I wrote from anyone, I used to ask that person his name, his genealogy, and the background of all his teachers. So every single teacher, every single person he met to take hadith from, he would do research and have a good sense who that person was, who his family was, and who all his teachers were. Um, and he said, I found in my journey, so many others were, they didn't care what they wrote. They just wrote everything down. So Bukhari was actually researching in his travels. He was investigating. He was getting more information. Um, and he said he always focused on the original notes of the teachers. So for him, it wasn't enough. Like he would ask the teachers to bring their original notes, and he would compare and contrast with others. Um, and he would sometimes write, but often he wouldn't write. In so many sessions, he was known not to write. Um, that famous session where he was traveling with a bunch of people, they, you know, because travel in that time was very difficult. You would find caravans or find people that are going to the same place, and you would kind of put your resources together and join the caravan. So he joined one of them, and, you know, his fellow students, they saw that 16 days passed, and he didn't write a single thing down. So then they rebuked him. They're like, you know, why are you wasting your time? You came all the way here for the serious uh, thing, uh, writing hadith and learning hadith, and you're just wasting your time. 16 days, you didn't write a single thing down. So he said, okay, how many hadith did you write down? They said 15,000. He said, okay, take your books out. So they took the books out, and he, says, um, he said, okay, listen. So they had their books out. He started reciting all the hadith, hadith after hadith. And they were amazed. So these are the incidents from his life from the people around him that realized he was something special. Um, you know, and he was a critical thinker. He wasn't just a memorizer. You know, one of the things people talk about is memorization, but he was not only a, he had photographic memory, but he was very analytical and critical. And one of the traditions of Islam is to discuss things with your teachers and, you know, even agree to disagree. Um, and that's what he did. Often, as I shared with you, incidents of him correcting his teachers. Sometimes the teachers would get mad and he would say, no, go get your books. And they would bring their books out and find that he was right. And this is when he's 16, when he's a teen. Um, so Bukhari himself used to say, knowledge is thinking, not just memorization. So, so when he was critiquing his teachers and his snaz, he could sense their mistakes. Because um, he knew all these narrators in detail and who they were, where they traveled. He knew their uh, kunyas, you know, as I mentioned, so on. One of the teachers asked the students, who is Abu Hamza, Abu this, and Abu that, just the kunyas. And no one knew um, who those kunyas were. And then Bukhari said, okay, Abu this is such and such. Abu that is such and such. And these are the unknown kunyas of these particular teachers. So his life was incredible. So um, there is a great incident um, that's linked to three great individuals. I mentioned maybe in a previous session, not in this session, there are two simultaneous ways of, of preserving knowledge. One is memory and one is writing. Both of them were there from the beginning with all traditions, with every field, even in Quran. The Quran was written down from day one. The Prophet had kutab, scribes. And it was also memorized. Same thing with hadith. So, um, so there are certain individuals who are known to be great memorizers, like Imam Zuhri, Imam Sharbi, and, and and so on and so forth. Um, so Imam Sharbi, for instance, he used to say, "I have never put black and white to this day of mine." So um, he said, "I have never put black on white to this day." And what did he mean by that? In Arabic, you have different ways of expressing things. That means ink on paper. He never put ink on paper because he memorized everything. This is a Hamar or Sharbi. Um, and he said, nor has anyone ever narrated hadith to me except that I memorize it. Um, so when this was being discussed, this is Amr al-Shabi, an early scholar. So in one of the sessions of hadith, the students were sharing the statement of his. And this was a session of Ishaq ibn Rahawai and Ali ibn Madini, two teachers of Bukhari. So Ishaq ibn Rahawai said to Ali, are you surprised? Min hadha? La fi hadha zaman. Uh, so he said, are you surprised by this? And he said, 
Uh, well, that was Bukhari. But he said, Awa ta'jabina min hadha, Ishaq ibn Rahwa, he said to Ali ibn al-Madini. He said, I have never heard a hadith except that I immediately memorized it. And he said, Ka'anni anzuru ila sab'ina alf hadith uh, fi kitabi. He said, it is, and right now it is as if I am seeing 70,000 hadith from my books. This is Ishaq ibn Rahwa, teacher of Imam al-Bukhari. So he said to Ali ibn Badin, look, I can see 70,000 hadith before my eyes right now. Ask me about any single one of them. Um, so, so, so this is you know, Amr al-Shabi statement. It was mentioned to Ishaq. Ishaq said this statement. And then someone mentioned the statement of Ishaq to Imam al-Bukhari. And he said, Imam al-Bukhari said, أو من هذا القول. Are you surprised by that? He said, "La'alla fi hada zaman man yanzuru ila mi'atay alf alf min kitabihi." He said, "There might be a person today who's looking at two hundred thousand hadith right in front of his eyes from memory." And who is he talking about? Himself. But that's a difference between Imam Bukhari and others. It tells you like what kind of person he was. He was very humble. He never praised himself, and he never criticized anyone by name, like directly with any derogatory name. He wanted to meet Allah with a clean slate. So he said this in an indirect way. There might be someone alive today who's looking at 200,000 hadith like he's looking at a piece of paper. So his memory was incredible. Um, so the most famous incident of his memory, and he became so famous. These incidents, many of them happened when he was 16 years old. He's traveling. So he became, imagine you're 16, and now imagine you're an adult now. Your reputation just grows. So he's traveling all over the world, he's learning hadith and he's teaching. So he had a famous visit to Baghdad. Baghdad was the center of the Muslim world at the time. So this is a great incident that tells you, you know, it kind of solidified his reputation. So he was visiting Baghdad and before he was going there, you know, everyone was excited because he's already famous. So what they did in Baghdad, a group of scholars got together, they said, let's test him. We'll test him in public. So they picked a hundred hadith and they assigned 10 to each person and every person was in charge of mixing up the isnads of those hadith with the matan. So there's groups of, 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 of people, um, each one has 10 hadith, so they did that with 10 sets, a hundred hadith. Um, so when Bukhari came, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people because it's so famous and Bukhari is like a center of knowledge at that time, it's a center of culture, it's a great uh, cultural and intellectual um, uh, outpost. And so they just began to test him. They said, okay, we want to read some hadith to you. So they brought the first person, read the hadith to him. So he read the first hadith, the Bukhari says, I don't know that hadith. And then the second hadith, I don't know that hadith. They did that to all hundred, all those people who went through every single one of them. And he said, I don't know those hadith. And people began to question him, well, this guy doesn't know anything. And then, then he clarified and he said, you know, but the hadith that I do know, and he read all hundred hadith with the right isnaz, they were all mixed up, he read them in the right order. So that tells you, you know, there's very few people like that in our tradition. I mean, there are a handful that Allah selects them, he gives them an ability um, that's the kind of ability you need to do the work that he, want, he, he was chosen to do. Because if he was just reading from his books, it takes you hours to look up a hadith in a book, thumbing through your library. Imam Muslim, how did he die? Who remembers how Imam Muslim died? There's a hadith he was trying to look up. Someone told him a hadith, he just couldn't find where it was. So he spent the entire night in his library going through book after book looking for the hadith. And someone had gave him a box of dates, one of the neighbors. It's like you have the dates in the back. Someone gave him like a bucket of dates. So, and he was so engrossed in his work, he told his family, don't bother me. So he locked himself in the library. The bucket of dates were there and just started eating the dates, looking book after book, looking through his manuscripts um, until morning came. The entire bucket was gone. He finally found the hadith. And that led to his demise because some illness happened immediately because of eating all those dates. Who knows what it was, it may, may have been diabetes or sugar, um, that's a huge carbohydrate overload, um, but eventually he died, uh, researching hadith, that was his end. So, you know, these are the scholars, um, but Imam Bukhari, 
the work that he produced with the Sahih, Al Jami Al Sahih, it's incredible work um, of the soundest hadith, but in producing like you know like his vision and giving you so much insights, giving you a holistic picture of the Sunnah. I mean that cannot be done except if you had all of it up here. So there are so many incidents from his life. Like one time, Yusuf ibn Musa al-Marwazi, he says, um, I was in the Masjid of Basra, and someone cried out, Muhammad ibn Ismail is here. And I didn't know who that was. So then someone walked me, I turned around, and he said, I saw a young boy, with, uh, or a young man, not a boy, young man with no white in his beard, very young adult. And that was Muhammad ibn Ismail. Um, and he said after, you know, uh, after you finished praying, people surrounded him asking for a hadith dictation session. And this is in Basra. So he agreed, but he said, we'll do it tomorrow. So they announced in the masjid, Imam Bukhari is going to teach us hadith tomorrow. So the next day, 1,000 people had gathered in the main masjid of Basra. All sorts of scholars of Quran and hadith and fiqh. Um, so he began by announcing to the people, people of Basra, you asked me to relate hadith to you. I'm just a young man, but you have hadith from your own region that are so important from great teachers of your region. So let me relate to you the hadith from your own land that many of you may not have. So he began to relate hadith for entire isnads from the people of Basra. So, and they learned from him. So who's just visiting the town, they learned about their own region, their own hadith. So there are so many uh, examples of that. Uh, Imam al-Bukhari, he admits, لا أجيء بحديث عن الصحابة والتابعين إلا عرفت مولد أكثرهم ووفاتهم ومساكنهم ولست أروي حديثا من حديث الصحابة والتابعين يعني من الموقوفات إلا وله أصل أحفظ ذلك عن كتاب الله وسنة رسوله He said, I have never brought a hadith of any companion except that unless I know who the companion was, where they lived, when they were born and when they died. And he said, I never report a hadith that's the words of the companion, like hadith mawquf, right? That doesn't go to the Prophet, but stops at one of the companions. I've never related a hadith that is mawquf of a companion, um, except that it has a basis in the Quran or in the Sunnah of the Prophet So when he relates hadith, you know, in their statements of Omar, there's always a base. This shows you his vision. His base is what? Is a Quranic paradigm. Everything is rooted in Quran and the sound sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Um, his scribe, Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim, he said one once Bukhari told him he couldn't sleep all night, you know, because he said, I wanted to count how many hadith were in all my books that I have written down. He already knows and memorized, but he wanted to go through his books, see how many written hadith he had. So he said, so he asked him, okay, so how many were there? He said 200,000. And that's, he spent the entire night just counting the hadith in his books. Um, and his scribe asked him, so have you memorized everything that's in your books, 200,000 hadith? Um, he said, of course. And I have revised all my books three times. Like I went through them from my memory, rewritten them three times. Um, so he had, he had an amazing vision, amazing grasp. Um, Ahmad ibn Hamdun, a great hadith expert, says that I saw Bukhari once at a janaza and he was speaking with Muhammad ibn Yahya Zuhali, another hadith expert, both great hadith experts of their region. And he said, each one of them, they were talking and discussing hadith, just throwing out hadith after hadith, what's the defect of this hadith, what's the defect of this chain? It was a high-level conversation of two experts. And he said, so he said in Arabic, رَأَيْتُ Bukhari فِي جَنَازَةٍ وَمُحَمَّدِ بْنُ يَحْيَى الذُّهَلِي يَسْأَلُهُ عَنِ الْأَسْمَاءِ وَالْعِلَلِ وَالْبُخَارِي يَمُرُّ فِيهِ مِثْلُ السَّهَمْ كَأَنَّهُ يَقْرَى قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ So it was Bukhari answering most of the questions. Zuhali is asking him. And Bukhari is just shooting his answers like arrows coming out of a bow. And as if he was reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas. So... Imam al-Bukhari admitted, ما جلست للتحديث حتى عرفت الصحيح الصحيح من السقيم حتى نظرت في كتب أهل الرأي. He said, I did not start teaching. I did not sit down to start teaching people until I had a grasp 
of all the sound reports from the weak reports, the sound reports from the defective report, and until I had learned all the books of fiqh. So he was an expert and very proficient in all the books of fiqh. And the, so Ahl al-Ra'i are the schools of fiqh in Kufa and Medina and so on and so on. Briefly about his students, uh, so Al-Farabri was one of his final students. He mentions that how many people learned from Bukhari? He says by the end of his life, after 16 years of, well, after a lifetime of travel and learning, and 16 years of compiling al jami al-Sahih, and then presenting it to his two teachers, Imam Ahmad and Ishaq al Rahawai, and then he began teaching it, and he spent a long period of his life teaching um, how many students learned the Sahih from him? Rough estimate, rough guess. Anyone know? 1,100 ballpark figure. 20,000, very good guess. So, Al Farabri says 90,000 people learned the Sahih from Imam Bukhari. And he was the, one of the final students. And he learned the Sahih a number of times from Imam al Bukhari. So most of the manuscripts of Sahih come through Al-Farabri. Um, some scholars say that it's maybe an exaggeration, 90,000, but we're talking tens of thousands of students that learned the Sahih from Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala. Yeah, I mean, so he would have dictation sessions. That's what a, when someone writes a book or hadith, then they teach it like Imam Malik teaching the Muatta. They would have that book in front of them they would teach from memory or from the book, and students would write down the entire Sahih. So some of the students, you know, like every Yama has circumstances, like, like some of y'all came late, right? So that same thing happened back then. So there were people uh, coming, and so they would write in their manuscript, I learned one-third of the Sahih from Imam Bukhari. The rest I got, I didn't have time, I had to leave, so I got it from another student. And other people write, you know, I got the entire Sahih, but I missed a chapter, except for the following chapter. Many of these manuscripts, they'll have those footnotes in there uh, from the early manuscript that this chapter contains all the Sahih as learned from Bukhari except for the following Hadith, which were missed, but they were uh, received from another source. So that happened as well. But there were many scholars that wanted to learn the entire Sahih. So many of the more proficient students, they learned the entire Sahih from Imam Bukhari. Then they cross-checked with Imam Bukhari's original version and then when he passed, his original version was passed on to others. So let's suffice with that and move on to the hadith. Any questions? So um, that's it. So there are thousands of manuscripts throughout the world. But the issue would be like, okay, how many or what are the early? They're all from various levels of... of time period, various time periods. So the primary issue here is, um, you know, paper doesn't last right forever. So whatever books are written today, in a thousand years, these books are not going to be here, the paper disintegrates. So it's unfair to, to ask for the original version that Imam Bukhari himself wrote, it would not have survived. Um, so but what happens is the way the Islamic tradition operates, like I mentioned, um, so a scholar teaches, right? And the scholar is teaching and he has his original book. So the students, they come with their own empty books, right? And then they, um, they transcribe the original from the teacher to their own works. And then the teacher signs off on it, meaning like this is an accurate copy. And then these students will teach others. So through their, with their own copies. So just like the Mus'haf of Uthman, radiallahu anh, what happened, Uthman sent, made six to seven copies, sent them throughout the Muslim world. And then scholars, when they learned Quran, they would come to that Mus'haf and copy it by hand to their own version. And then they would teach that. And that's how books were transmitted. So we have original manuscripts going back to like a couple of generations after Bukhari. So we don't have his time, obviously, but we have originals that are fairly recent. But when you understand the way the tradition operated, you can be certain that this is a fair reproduction of the original, an accurate, fairly accurate reproduction of the original. But today there's, there's 
there are um, many, many manuscripts. So um, in Princeton University, for instance, um, Orthman is here, he's a student at Princeton, but they have a manuscript section. So they have, they have several hundred copies of Sahih Bukhari. So like I was thumbing through their index once and it mentioned, okay, this copy that's partial. A lot of them are like 100 pages, maybe part of it. A lot of them are like fairly complete with some missing chapters. A lot of them just a handful of chapters. But there's so many manuscripts there. Some of them are 200 years old. Some of them are 400 years old. I don't know what the earliest was there, but so there are many places throughout the Muslim world and in the non-Muslim world where many of these manuscripts are, are hidden. Right here. That's the official Bukhari. That's what happens with the book. Like you have to work on a book and rewrite it. Not rewrite it, but you have to write it in a font that reflects what people can read. Like I showed you pictures of the manuscript. I brought the whole book. I brought it every week for you guys to see, but it's so heavy. After like the fifth class, I got tired and now I don't want to carry it no more. But we have a very early manuscript, sorry, Bukhari, the entire manuscript. And in Turkey, they reproduce it and they sell it. It's this huge and it's, so you can read it. If you look closely, you have to kind of squint. You can read all the, you can make out all the words. But it's kind of harder to read because the modern reader is accustomed to a different font. So that wouldn't fly. You can't just keep producing that, take pictures of that. Now you have to like take that and put it in a different font. That's what was done over the years. So it's like all these publishing houses, they just take the original and they rewrite it and they might put extra footnotes. So that's what keeps happening. So there's no book in the history of humanity that has as many editions, as many commentaries, as many accessory works written on it as Sahih Imam Bukhari. This is a, probably the only work that we can be fairly certain word for word is coming from the altar. You can't say that about Shakespeare. You can't say that about other books because, you know, books are written, but then, you know, they die out. People stop reading them or then you have to kind of reconstruct things. Like there's a discovery of the Maghazi of Musa ibn Uqba recently, right? So that's a huge discovery. So um, that's the earliest Sira book ever written uh, or the earliest Maghazi book ever written. So Musa ibn Uqba is someone who's in Sahih al-Bukhari. He's a very reliable transmitter of the Maghazi. So he wrote a book that was absorbed into Ibn Ishaq. It was absorbed into Sahih al-Bukhari. So it was around, but then it got lost. So early scholars, they referred to it. They used to read it. They used to study it. But what happened is then the book itself got lost because everyone else absorbed that book into their own books. So that original got lost, and it was recently discovered two years ago. The full book was discovered, the manuscript, from an early time. It's a lot of excitement. So it was published by like an Arabic publishing house, and now there are three different translation teams rushing to translate it into English. And that's a huge deal. So there are non-Muslims trying to translate it. There are Muslims trying to translate it. But you have to understand how the tradition operates. It doesn't matter we don't have the original because we have the originals right here. Whole Sahih is right here, without a doubt. But who cares if the original manuscript is there or not? That doesn't make a huge difference for us. The Western scholarship, they, they're heavy into manuscripts. For them, oh, we need the original. They're always talking about the originals. But then for their own tradition, you, have, you don't have the original for like Homer's Iliad, the Odyssey, all these classical works. You don't have the originals because they don't survive. Originals can't survive unless they're on like metal. So like the only thing original we have is the Rosetta Stone, right? Because it's on, it's on stone. So that's, that's an original. But other than that, if you use it on leather, bones, everything will disintegrate over time. Unless people keep memorizing the book, keep spreading like the Quran. You keep memorizing. It doesn't matter if all the Quran's copy, copies are lost today. We have people in this room that memorize it. They can rewrite it for you. So we don't rely on written books. We rely on like, you know, Partially rely on books, but like that's not our primary reliance. Wallahu a'lam. I think, is that your question? Okay, who's going to volunteer for the Isna chart? Uh -uh. It's a double one too? Yes, it's a double one. Okay. So, and I need a reader. So. I need a reader and I need an it's not chart. Oh, yeah. 
So you can start backwards if you want, so you don't like run out of space. I'll need two, right? Kind of yeah, but the, the primary one is the first one. Keep that. Keep that? Okay. Yeah. That, keep... Then it converges and it comes back. No, that'll be a side. It's on the side. I'll show you. Yeah. Right, well, just and, okay. just write the primary first. Okay. Then we'll see. Okay. Any volunteers to read? Okay. Go ahead. Do you mind using it? Do you have a copy of your site here? Or... Can you see? Yeah, I can see. So, um, since it's the final two classes, I have to say this, when you read a hadith book or a traditional book, instead of just reading, like, you, so what you're trying to do is um, continue that tradition of reading these books, these hadith books. So when you read hadith to any teacher, um, you read them in that traditional way and you get the snad of that teacher. So whenever you read hadith to me, um, if you choose to carry on that tradition, it's a symbolic thing, then um, that's what ijaza is. I read this entire book to this teacher. So you can say that you put that on your resume and your ijazas and your isnad. So for that to work, what you do is in the beginning of a session, when you read a book, you say the following, you say, بِإِسْنَادِكَ الْمُتَّصِلَةِ so you link yourself with the isnad. So you link yourself to the teacher and his isnads to this author, then you read his book. So you're not just reading the book like hanging in the air. That would be mu'allaq. That's a mu'allaq hadith, right? Bukhari sometimes does it. He'll just quote a teacher several generations away without linking himself to that. Um, so that second isnad, if you use a different color, yeah, the primary one, yeah, try a different color. Um, so, so whoever reads, uh, say B, which means with, isnadika, your isnad, al-mutasila, that is connected, ila, to al-musannif, the author, rahimahullah, you make dua, and you say qal, yani the author says, then you read Bukhari's words. So I'll, I'll help you, bi isnadika, al-mutasila, ila al-musannifi, Rahimahullah ta'ala. Qal. And now you say what he called. Then, then here, the ha, you're supposed to read ha. Just say ha. And then continue. Ibn Abdullah. Ubaidullah ibn Abdullah. Ubaidullah ibn Okay, good. Jazakallah khair. So, the isnad. So, hadathana abdan, hadathana abdullah, hadathana yunus, and then a zuhri. From, okay, so the way you do this, um, yeah, you're just repeating. Um, so, so, I like the black as a primary isnad. So, the bishar just changed to abdan. And don't do the secondary yet. Let's put Abdan there. Okay, and Zuhri, let's complete the Isnad. Zuhri is, above Zuhri is who? No, that's the students of Zuhri. Ubaidullah, Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Ut Ubaidullah. So above Zuhri is Ubaidullah, in the black, yeah. Yeah, you're gonna need a little more space. Ubaidullah, and then you have Ibn Abbas. Actually, that's all. Baidullah then Ibn Abbas. Everyone can see? Yeah, yeah black is better, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. All the other colors Yeah. Okay, so let's just, let's just construct the isnad here. So, Hadathana um, Abdan from Abdullah, from Yunus, from Zuhri. And then when you say ha, what does ha mean? So this is very, very important. So in isnad, um, you often find this ha. 
this is called ha at tahwil so this is basically the ha is basically tahwil in arabic means to uh, change so it's giving you a different isnad so now it's like uh, the three dots so you have this isnad in english we put three dots now let me give you another isnad that's what bukhari is doing so the primary isnad is up to zuhri like this and then ha now he's starting again so picking up where he left off, ha, and you start again. So what does he do after that? Is that a selected, um, is it a one of many selections or selection that he chose for in terms of the net? I mean, something he chose, obviously, but like he would have many isnads, but yeah, this but is he, what he, he chose this specifically. Yeah, yeah. So, so the ha, the purpose of the ha is like to create, uh, to give you a new isnad. And part of an isnad, like sometimes if so the way so the way Ramjan wrote the two isnads, he could have done that, Bukhari. He would say, Hadathana Bishr bin Muhammad Abdullah Yunus would say the names again. But then that's repeating names. So that's why you get up to Zuhri, then you do ha, and then you say, Wahadathana, what's the next? Wahadathana Bishr ibn Muhammad. Now in green, you can put on the level Abdan, put Bishr ibn Muhammad. Like where Abdan is, yeah. Bishr ibn Muhammad. Qala akhbarana Abdullah. So do we see an Abdullah anywhere? So it's the same Abdullah. So you, you draw the line and make it go to Abdullah. Yeah, in, in blue, in the green, yeah. There you. And now from Abdullah. And then what's next? Akhbarana Yunus wa Ma'mar an Zuhri. So Abdullah, now you come come back out to a, well, Yunus is the same, make a green arrow simultaneously going up. There you go. Yunus from Zuhri, that's the same. But then he, Abdullah has also Ma'mar. But that's really coming out from Abdullah. So you have to like kind of, So Abdullah's teacher is Ma'mar. Good. And Ma'mar is going to Zuhri. And then Zuhri says, Qal, now you're coming back to the common unit. Akhbarani Ubaidullah. And then Ubaidullah says, An ibn Abbas. Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? So now you see this nod chart. It's not chart. Okay? So now let's go through the names as we always do. So let's go through like Zohri we did. Um, we did the biography of Mama Zohri. Um, did we do our Baidullah? Uh, I think we did. Ubaidullah. No, actually we didn't. Okay. Okay, so one to highlight here is so you need to become familiar with the great names, which are the nodes. These are the names that keep repeating. Um, so Zuhri, the teacher of Malik, for sure. Almost every hadith is coming through Zuhri. And we said Zuhri, like is like Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira, the most prolific narrator among the companions. Zuhri is the most famous, the most prolific narrator among the Tabirin. So he has a status of Abu Huraira. So you, you cannot afford to not know Imam Zuhri. Every or many, not every, but so many Isnads go through Imam Zuhri. So you start seeing the same names. You start seeing the same students. Uh, we talked about his students uh, prior to this, but let's focus on Abdullah. Anybody know who Abdullah is? Yeah, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. So Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. So that's someone you really need to know. So Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak is huge. He's huge in, in hadith. He's huge in the Muslim tradition. Um, his full name was Abu Abdurrahman, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, ibn Wadih al-Marwazi. He's one of the most celebrated early Muslims. He has an incredible life. He's quite unique in some regards. He's unique in the fact that he's one of the few people Perhaps it could be that he's the only person that was never criticized by anybody. So his like praise is unanimous. So you can't say that about anyone. Not Imam Malik, not Imam Shafi, not Abu Hanifa, not Imam Ahmad. 
even the four imams were criticized by some people. I'm not saying rightfully or wrongfully so. Abdullah ibn Mubarak is one of the few people that is not criticized by anybody because of who he was. And he was so prolific in his scope. Like he wasn't just, you couldn't put him in a box. Imam Nawawi says about him the following. Uh, he describes him, Al-Imam Al-Muttafiq ala jalalatihi wa imamatihi wa idhami mahallihi wa siyadatihi wa wara'ihi wa ibadatihi wa sahaihi wa shaja'atihi wa ghayriha min nafa'is sifatihi jama'a al-ilma wa al-fiqha wa al-adaba wa al-nahwa wa al-lugha wa al-zuhd wa al-shi'ar wa al-fasaha wa al-wara'a wa al-insaf wa qiyam al-layl wa al-ibada wa al-shidda fi ra'ihi so just that description tells you there's something special about this person. He was al-muttafiq, al-muttafiq ala jalalatihi, al-muttafiq ala jalalatihi. He's one of the few people who's an expert al-imam, but his jalala, his, his greatness was agreed upon unanimously. His leadership, his great uh, status, his wara, his worship, his, his piety, his generosity. Um, he combined knowledge and fiqh and adab, language and Arabic and zuhud and poetry and so many things, qiyamul layl at night. So he's one of those people that is incredible. Like he's divided his entire life between, um, in three portions. So he divided his entire life that four months teaching knowledge, four months traveling for Hajj and the pilgrimage, four months fighting fi sabilillah. So he was a mujahid, he was a alim, he was a traveler. He was known as Safar, the great traveler. He's one of the first people to travel for the sake of knowledge. Um, Imam, Ahmad used to, uh, Imam Ahmad said the following about him. Imam Ahmad, he's a hadith critic. So he uh, describes narrators, whether they're trustworthy or not. And his words are usually brief. But in Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, he says, لم يكن في زمن ibn al-Mubarak أطلب للعلم منه رحل إلى اليمن والشام ومصر والبصر والكوفة وكان من روات العلم وأهل ذلك كتب عن الصغار والكبار وجمع أمرا عظيما ما كان أحدا أقل سقطا منه كان يحدث من كتاب كان صاحب حديث حافظا So he says, he was, in his time, there was no one who was more learned than him. Because he was one of the first people to travel all over the world, to Yemen and Sham and Misr. So he's above Bukhari by how many generations? Two, right? That's Bukhari's teacher on the bottom. And then Abdullah ibn Mubarak. So he was one of the few, the first people to travel widely for the sake of knowledge. Um, he's called Alim al Mashriqi wal Maghrib wa ma baynahuma. So so many people described him. He had um, so many great qualities. Um, so he was someone incredible. This, you know, you could read entire books about him. Uh, his teachers were people like Hisham bin Urwa, Armash, Yahya al Ansari, Musa bin Uqba, the manuscript that was recently discovered. That was a teacher of Abdullah ibn al Mubarak. Um, so his ethnic origin is interesting. He's half Turkish, half Persian. His father was a former Turkish slave. His mother was uh, from Khwarezm, Persian. So he was born in 118, and he died 181 of the Hijri calendar after returning from a battle against the Byzantines. So coming back from a battle is how he died in route. And what a great status that is. He's one of the only people who's never criticized. He was very wealthy. He was known for generosity, spending his money upon people. Um, and he was very pious, spent his nights in worship. So it's amazing when you see the Isnad, when you see Hadath and Abdullah, that's talking about Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. So I need you to start, you know, looking at these Isnads, let these names come alive for you. So that's Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. So now coming back down to Abdan, the teacher of Imam al-Bukhari is Abdan. So Abdan died in the year 221. So Abdan, a brief quick biography about him. His full name was Abu Abdurrahman Abdullah ibn Uthman ibn Jabala. Um, he was a great hadith expert of Maru and a student of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. Um, see, he 
Why did he have the name Abdan? Abd means slave. Abdan means two slaves. So, why do you think he had that title? <laughs> Good guess. So, because his name was Abdullah and his kunya was Abu Abdurrahman. So, he had Abd in his kunya and Abd in his name. Someone just started calling Abdan and it caught on. There were a handful of people known as Abdan. So, there's no huge significance to that. It just, these are Al Qab. The titles are very interesting. They just catch on. Um, so, he was his primary teacher was Abdullah ibn al Mubarak. Okay. He also learned from Shorba. Um, he learned from Imam Malik. Uh, he learned from Hamad bin Zaid. And his students are Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Nasa'i. Um, all six relate from him except for Ibn Majah for some reason. So he was trustworthy, his grading is thiqa. He's someone considered to be highly trustworthy. Um, the interesting fact about him, they said, Abdan fi hayatihi bi alf alf dirham. So they estimated how much he spent in charity in his lifetime. And alf alf dirham is what? Arabic alf alf means what? Million. That's how you say million in Arabic, alf alf. So he spent a million dirhams in charity in his lifetime. Um, so he was an incredible one of the teachers, Imam Bukhari from Maru. And also Abdullah ibn Mubarak also from Mar. Maru. So when, you have, when you're from Maru, um, the title you get is Al-Marwazi. So, so you see this pattern. Remember I mentioned uh, Bukhari, to get reports from any teacher, he prefers the students that live with that teacher. So Abdan is from the same region as Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. So he privileges that. That's a priority for him. For him, the best teachers of, best students of every teacher is what he's going for. And those who spent the most time with the teachers, uh, that's a preference for him. So that's Abdan. Then you have Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. Then you have Yunus. And Yunus, I believe we did talk about Yunus. Yunus ibn Yazid. He died in the year 159. He was among the uh, more reliable students of Imam Zuhri. He's from the top tier students of Imam Zuhri. So his, but there's something about him. Um, so this is just an interesting, like a tidbit of Ilal that he's considered reliable from his books. Uh, so Imam Ahmad used to say, they used to ask, how is he? They said, إِذَا حَدَّثَ مِنْ كِتَابِهِ فَهُوَ ثِقَى إِذَا حَدَّثَ مِنْ حِفْظِهِ يُخْطِئِ If he's relating hadith from his books, he's reliable, fully trustworthy. But when he's relating from memory, he tends to make mistakes. So, so he was one of those people who wrote the, the hadith of Zuhri down, but sometimes he related from memory and he would make mistakes. So Yunus ibn Yazid died in the year 159. Who's above him? Imam Zuhri. So we covered his biography already. Who's above Imam Zuhri? Ubaidullah. So Ubaidullah ibn Abdullah ibn Utba ibn Mas'ud. He died in the year 99. We covered his biography in Hadith 101. Anyone remember what group he was part of? Any guesses? One of the Sabah Fuqaha of Medina. Seven jurors of Medina. So, you know, Zuhri is a great Imam of Medina. So now you have an Isnad here of Maru. Then you're switching to Zuhri. Now Zuhri is getting the knowledge from Medina. So often Zuhri's teachers are the great uh, Imams of Medina. And who are the best Imams of Medina? I mentioned there were seven. Sabar Fuqaha al Medina. Um, who are like the students of, or the children of companions. Most of them were children of Sahaba. So when the Sahaba passed, these seven people were the repositories that everyone turned to for knowledge, for fatwa. So Ubaidullah was born in the Khilaf of Umar. He was the grandson of Utbah, Utbah ibn Mas'ud. Utbah was the one that the Prophet made the brother of Ibn Mas'ud uh, when they made the Hijrah. So his grandson was Ubaidullah ibn Abdullah. Um, he was a great scholar of hadith, fiqh, and poetry. So he's a tabari. Uh, Zuhri described him as an ocean of knowledge. He learned from Ibn Abbas, from Aisha radiallahu anha, from Ibn Umar, from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, from Abu Huraira, from Um Salama, from Maimuna, and many, many others. 
he was the teacher of Omar bin Abdul Aziz, the Khalifa. So he became blind later in his life and um, he died, as I mentioned, in the year 99. So that's one of the seven joys of Medina and his teacher is Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas, the famous companion. We don't do biographies of companions because we expect everyone to know that. Um, Ibn Abbas, what did we say? The last hadith was about, from Ibn Abbas as well. What, what did we say about him? Just what was the hadith about? And this hadith is very similar. What was he known for? One of the things. Tafsir. So he's known for tafsir. So often his hadith um, have to do with tafsir. And um, so here it's not necessarily about tafsir, but then. Uh, so what's the hadith? Before we get to the hadith, so now ha, when he switched to a different isnad, now Imam al Bukhari relates from a different teacher, Bishr ibn Muhammad. So Bishr ibn Muhammad died in the year 224 of the Hijri calendar. Um, he's the Bukhari is the only one of the six who relates from him. So he was trustworthy, but he was belonged to a deviant group. He was a follower of Tupac. What's that group called? <laughs> Only God can judge me, right? Murja. Murja. So he was accused of Irja. He was a follower of that school. Murja are those that believe that actions are divorced from uh, Iman. So um, so this, again, this is the theme we talked about last week. Imam Bukhari is not afraid to take from anyone, as long as he's certain that the hadith is sound. Even if it's from someone from a different group that might not have the best beliefs or the correct beliefs, um, but as long as he's certain the hadith is sound, the primary hadith comes through solid channel. But now he brings a accessory isnad from Bishr ibn Muhammad that goes from Abdullah ibn Mubarak from Yunus. Where Abdullah ibn Mubarak also relates to hadith from Ma'mar. So Ma'mar is important. Ma'mar died in the year 153 of the Hijri calendar. He was an early hadith scholar of Basra. He's from Basra. And he settled in Yemen. Ma'mar is huge. So Ma'mar was a student of the six prolific narrators of hadith, the six Madar al-Hadith. Remember I mentioned there are six pivots of hadith. Most hadith isnas go through those six. As people like, you know, Abu Ishaq, Sabiri, Zuhri, and others, Sufyan ibn Uriyena. So he was a student of all six. So he was someone like who was a great hadith expert, had great um, teachers. He attended the janazah of Hassan al-Basri. Um, that's how early he is. Uh, he died in the year 153. So Ma'mar was very reliable from Imam al-Zuhri. Now, Ma'mar was eventually settled in Yemen. He was from Basra. And in Yemen, he became a great um, associate of Abdul Razak Sanani. And Abdul Razak related hadith from him. So when he came to Yemen, they invited him to stay. They wanted him to teach hadith. So one of the things very interesting. Uh, so what did they do to trap him? They found a local bride for him. So they, they invited him to Yemen and they found someone to marry him so he would have an excuse to stay. And that's how Abdul Razak and many others got hadith from him. So he's extremely sound and strong, but so Ma'mar has like this, this, uh, this, this caveat about his reliability. So he's one of the people whose reliability is regional. So this is one of the things that I, we pointed out, Imam Bukhari was so sophisticated and the early muhaddithin. It's not just the case, this person's reliable, all his hadith is good. This person's weak, all his hadith are weak. But they were looking at circumstances, digging deeper. So Ma'mar is one of those people who's not strong from the people of Iraq. Um, but he's very strong from other people like Zuhri, from the people of Medina. Why? Because when he was visiting Iraq, he didn't have his notebook, his notes with him. So learning from the people of Iraq, he would often make mistakes. So, so Yahya ibn Ma'in said, إِذَا حَدَّثَكَ مَعْمَرُ عَنِ الْعِرَاقِيِّينَ فَخَالِفْهُ إِلَّا مِنَ الزُّهْرِ وَإِبْنِ طَعُوسِ فَإِنَّ حَدِيثُهُ عَنْهُمْ, عنهم مستقيم. So from the people of Iraq, he made a lot of mistakes, narrating from people like Amash and Qatada, Imam Asim. So there's something you have to keep in mind. Sometimes 
A student is strong from his particular teacher, but he's not strong from another teacher. So all these things were factored in by these great Imams, Imam Bukhari and Muslim, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Ma'amar comes back to Zuhri. So that completes the Isnad. So this is what the Isnad looks like of this particular hadith. And there's an interesting hadith for Asif. Asif, you're awake? Okay. So Ma'amar, um, he narrated a hadith. If you look this hadith up in uh, Sunan Abi Dawood, it's there. So uh, it's a hadith with an isnad that goes back to Qatada from Anas ibn Malik from the Prophet Sallallahu that he fil wal kahil. The Prophet had hijama performed upon him from three different spots in his neck. This is a hadith in uh, Kitab al tib of Abu Dawood. So in the hadith, Ma'mar, he narrates, he said, I'd made hajama on myself and it messed me up. It messed up my memory until I couldn't even recite Fatiha in the Salah. I had to keep repeating myself. So what happened is, and he says why, he said he got hijama performed on top of his head. So it was like the wrong spot. So this is interesting. It's just a tidbit that's part of the isnad of the hadith. So that was Ma'mar making that comment. So this description is top of his head. So he had a headache and he thought, well, let me perform hajama right there. So he did it there and he said, just mess me up. And my aql was gone for a while and I kept forgetting even Fatiha. Yeah, so these things happen with, with scholars, right? Like. Like um, a lot of them make mistakes. So sometimes, so that's called mughafal, right? Mughafal, ghafla is heedlessness. Someone who makes so many mistakes, <clears throat> they're called mughafaleen. Like people are like, you know, they're careless with hadith. Imam al Qutni relates, there's an incident where he was reading one of the students wrote hadith down and the hadith says, An Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an Jibreel, an illah, on Rajulin, Qal. So the Isnad says, from you know the Prophet, from Jibri, from Allah, from a man. So Dar Qutni says, the scholar Abu Lainan, he says, you know, I was thinking, well, what kind of Isnad is that? How did this student write down from Allah, from a man, on Rajulin? So he asked for the notes and he looked at you know the notes. So what it says is, on Jibreel, on Allah, uh, Azza wa Jalla. So Azza wa Jalla, the way it's written, is the same skeletal script as on Rajulin because they didn't use the dots. So careless students writing hadith down and he just thought, oh, it says on Rajulin. So it's from Allah, from a, a person. So this happens. So these are the things scholars are looking at. Okay, any questions on the Isnad before we get into the hadith? Yes. So we have, can I have the microphone? <laughs> Also, if you give a sign of cheeks, you can see the story. So, given what you just said about Bishop, would that chain be included in the 80 that are criticized? Oh, Allah Alam, those 80 were particular people that criticized them. So, is it Allah Alam? But the chain will not be criticized because the chain is not resting on that, it's resting on this. The, the chain is solid. So, this is used in accessory capacity. So you can say it's a supporting isnad, it's not primary. This is the primary isnad, that's a supporting isnad. And with Mahmar, I thought we had mentioned the Mahmar in, uh, in the previous classes that his mind is reliable, and that's why we were pulling apart that hadith. Yeah, yeah. Hadith. So, so Mahmar, so he's regionally strong, he's thiqa ma'moon, but um, Abu Hatim called him Salih al-Hadith. So even in Zuhri, um, he does have mistakes. So the thing is, you don't eliminate a reporter that makes mistakes, you look at his reports and see which ones he made mistakes in. So uh, Ma'amar generally was reliable from, from Zuhri, but, um, but Zuhri, the top tier students of Zuhri is among those, but he's not like number one. So he did make mistakes, um, but scholars were judged independently what the, so like 
Yahya bin Ma'in said this, Ma'mar athbat fi zuhri min ibn Uyayna. So Yahya felt that Ma'mar was better than Sufyan ibn Uyayna. But Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qatan said, no, Sufyan ibn Uyayna is better in the hadith of Zuhri than Ma'mar. So here there are differences of opinion, uh, but so he's roughly in the same ballpark, but that doesn't preclude them from making mistakes. Good point. Okay. Yeah. The numbers that are at the back are those other narrations. Numbers where? Oh, I don't know. That that's the that's the Darut uh, Tasil edition. So I don't know how they set it up. We don't have it. It's just I, I took it from a PDF. So I'm not sure what those numbers mean. It's where in this uh, Bukhari? Yeah. Okay, so those are the numbers of the same hadith that appears in Bukhari. It says Al Haqqad and then it says Muslim. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 they're narrating the very same hadith. That's Muslim. So this hadith, okay, Bukhari relates the same hadith in five places in Sahih. So here, then in Kitab al Som, then Kitab Bad al Khalq. Kitab al Manaqir, Kitab Fadail al Quran, and Kitab al Fadail. So, in various places, five different places, hadith is repeated. So, that's uh, the methodology of Bukhari. He brings the same hadith in various chapters to give you more benefits. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? No, there's two different. So, the primary one is in black. Then the Ha gives you the second Isnad is coming from Bishr through the same Isnad. Bishr is connecting to Abdullah, but he also has an additional teacher. So it's like a caveat. Yunus too? No, it's Abdullah to Ma'mar. So Yunus and Ma'mar are fellow students of Zuhri. So Abdullah goes to Ma'mar. And Abdul, so Abdullah learned from Yunus and from Ma'mar. And Yunus and Mamar both got the hadith from Zohri. Um, let me show you my. No, the Tahwil says, Hadathana Bishar ibn Muhammad, Kala Akbarana Abdullah, Kala Akbarana Yunus wa Mamar and his Zohri. Yeah, it says, Wa Mamar and his Zohri. So it's Abdullah speaking that Yunus and Ma'mar related to us from Zuhri, Nahwahu, yani the same hadith. And then it continues. Yeah, you can if you count that as three, I'm counting as from Bukhari as two different teachers. So you can say one it's not two, three. You can say three, yeah. If you put them separately, it depends how you count. Um but like the three, it's not that all the names are different. It's like most of the snouts are the same. It's just there's an additional teacher here, an additional teacher there. That's what's happening here. Okay. Um, any other questions? Ask him by. You don't have to give him the mic. I say you don't have to give him the mic. I don't want to trust him with the mic. <laughs> Does Imam Bukhari narrate directly from Azuri anywhere? Azuri? Yeah. No, that's too early. So Bukhari takes from the students of Zuhri. So, so he well, takes directly from the students of Zuhri. I don't know. For some reason, like when I just Google Azuri, and one of his said one of his like famous students from Bukhari. From Zuhri? I guess. No, I don't think that's true. No, no, Zuhri, no. The thing I the thing I was questioning was sometimes you have it's not with like. He said the shortest one was three chain. Right? Yeah, he could have. Um, so, no, there's no Bukhari. Can Bukhari go from uh, having like three chains and then he just narrates one chain? Is that what you're saying? Or more? Or more, yeah, because cause you're not making up the hadith. If you were making it up, then you just pick your teachers. I learned from this guy, you picked the shortest chain. But these hadith are actual hadith being taught through people. So, this hadith doesn't come through, it's a shorter, short, shorter chain. So they're being accurate here. So that's a, that's a proof of the reliability of this because everyone wants a short chain. If they were making it up, why would you put eight people in your chain? You would put all your chains to be very strong, uh, short and strong, many high chains. So, but they were being very, very accurate there. Sometimes the hadith, they didn't get from the teacher, but they got through a student of the teacher. So sometimes Bukhari relates from a teacher, but then 
some hadith he relates from a student of that teacher to the same teacher. Although he learned from that teacher, but he didn't learn that, that particular hadith from that teacher. So it's a sophisticated science. And then generations are like, you know, are kind of, so here, this is the long chain, you're right. It's, it's a lot of people going to Zohri. Generally, it's, it's Bukhari, through a teacher from, uh, from a student of Zohri, one or two links in the, in the middle. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, sister, go ahead. So that's a good question. So the answer there is like, this is not a zero sum game. It's not this person is Adil and this person is not. It's like a huge spectrum. So that's one thing. So for Bukhari, like, so for Adil, what was important for him and Adil was not lying. So those people that he took from, he knew they weren't liars. And that's a huge moral thing for him. That's enough for him. Uh, as long as they're not liars and they fit everything else, they're, they're accurate, and he wasn't afraid to take those reports. But Muslim disagreed. The Imam Muslim was a great expert, he disagreed, and other Imam Ahmad would have disagreed. So these people, some of them didn't touch people like that. So I believe, I mean, I, I love Bukhari's methodology because he's not afraid to learn from everyone. But it's not about learning from everyone, it's about the truth. If the truth is with your opponent, um, or someone who is on a different side, and that person is not huge, like, if that person is really out there, right, like, and it's questionable, he's even Muslim, then of course, they wouldn't apply. Bukhari didn't take for anyone like that. But if they belong to an orientation or uh, some her heretical group that's not considered part of mainstream Islam, um, you know, if that they're not card-carrying members, they're not leaders of that group, then some people will willing to look at their information. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Like today, what happens today, people label, like the labels people throw around, this person is such and such, this person is such and such. Once you label a person, that's it. He's shot out, he's gone forever. And that's a horrible way of living. Like you just label someone and you eliminate everything. You lose out on so much good. You see so much you learn from different types of teachers from all over the spectrum. So we need to be open like Bukhari was. But it's not the case, I pointed out again, he's not taking all the hadith from these people. That Shia narrative, that teacher that I mentioned, this funny story, Bukhari only has one hadith from him. He doesn't relate all his hadith. He, he rejected most of his hadith. But there's one hadith he wanted to use in accessory capacity and he used it. That means he wasn't afraid to look at his information. But it's not that he's his teacher and he's relating everything from him. So they're much more sophisticated than that. Allahu alam. Okay, let's move on to the hadith itself. So we can finish the hadith today. So the hadith is a description of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. A beautiful description. And what's the chapter? Every hadith, you have to relate it to the chapter heading to see why is the hadith there and what Bukhari is trying to teach you. It's the beginning of Revelation, right? Bad al Wahi, Kitab Bad al Wahi. So now this hadith is directly relevant because it's talking about Ramadan and Revelation. Okay? It's trying to prove that Revelation began in Ramadan. So if you put it together with, the, although the hadith doesn't say that directly, but we know it began in Ramadan. So, um, so here the description, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَجْوَدَ النَّاسِ The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم was the most generous of all people. وَكَانَ أَجْوَدُ مَا يَكُونُ فِي رَمَضَانِ حِينَ يَلْقَاهُ جِبْرِيلِ And his generosity increased even more so in Ramadan when he met Jibreel عليه وسلم. وَكَانَ يَلْقَاهُ فِي كُلِّ لَيْلَةٍ مِنْ رَمَضَانِ and Jibreel used to meet him in every night of Ramadan. His nightly sessions with Jibreel in Ramadan. What did they do in those sessions? Fayudarisuhul Quran. Yudarisu, 
Arabic student. Darasa means to learn, right? What is darasa? Darasa is the first form. Darasa is that. Uh, no, teach will be darasa. Mudarris is a teacher. That's darasa. Exchange. So darasa is like the third form. It means reviewing, learning from one another, discussions, exchange. So kana yudarisihu al-Qur'an. The Prophet وسلم, was learning the Quran from Jibreel, asking questions. So it was a back and forth. It wasn't just listening to the Quran, memorizing and leaving. Yudaris. There was a there was lessons happening. That's something amazing. Kana yudarisihu al-Quran. Um, and then he ends by saying, "Fala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam ajwadu bil khairi bin al-rih al and the Messenger of Allah surely was more generous than a flowing wind. So that's the end of the hadith. So this is a beautiful, beautiful hadith where, you know, you learn so many things. There are so many insights and lessons here. Um, the end, the conclusion is the wind. The wind is a metaphor for the incredible flowing nature of the generosity of the Prophet There's no better description than a wind because the wind, when it comes, it touches everything. It doesn't discriminate. It's not like one solid thing coming to you but it's just coming to a whole region bringing all sorts of things for it and the wind is a metaphor sometimes for um good things and like so in the quran you have he's the one who sends allah sends the winds as glad tidings um full of his mercy you know bringing his mercy so the metaphor of the wind is very beautiful. Um, so the generosity of the Prophet ﷺ, so you can see in the hadith, is building on successive points. Um, so I think Ibn Hajar makes this point that, number one, first, that's the first level. He was the most generous of everyone. All human beings are all human beings. The most generous is the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. So that's the first level. So like unmatched among the human race. So it's incredible. His generosity is unmatched among the human race. But then what's the next? Um, his generosity increased in Ramadan more than other times. So someone who's already the most generous of all human beings. And then add to that the generosity going even higher. Then how can it go higher? But can I yakunu fi Ramadan? He was even more generous than his own self in Ramadan. And his generosity increased when he met Jibreel. That's the third level, studied Quran with him. So the generosity, it's all about the generosity. So you can see the good effects of this whole environment. So that's an incredibly beautiful picture. The best human being is sitting with the best angel sitting in the best place, the city of Mecca, in the best time of Ramadan, studying the best words from the best speaker. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What's the wisdom of the dirasa of the, of the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Aini says it was to renew his conviction. Um, there was this developing this student-teacher relationship of uh, teaching Quran and this represents Allah's fulfillment of his promise to preserve the Quran in the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. Remember the previous hadith was the Prophet was told not to move your lips and not to worry because we will make sure you don't forget it. This is part of making sure he doesn't forget it. The Prophet sent, uh, Allah sent Jibreel to the Prophet ﷺ every single night in Ramadan to review Quran for dirasa, yudaris ul Quran. So Ibn Hajar makes a point that the Quran connects you with Allah and then makes you independent from the world. And that's how it makes you more generous. That's like a spiritual connection. The more you're connected to Allah, the less you're connected with people. When you're independent of people, you don't need them. That's where you're willing to give up what you have and be more generous. So that's the only way, the best path to generosity is to connect with Allah and to connect with good people. Um, and to connect with the words of Allah Azawajal. And he also makes a point that Allah's sunnah is to create a season of more blessings and generosity, and the Prophet was following that. There's so many things you can learn here. Part of that is 
the night time. When did the Prophet study the, the Quran with Jibri? At night. Kulla Laylatin. That means the night has a special uh, you know, uh, effect on the hearts. And there's a special connection with the Quran at night. That's more than during the day. Because at night, there's no distractions. Everyone's asleep. The lights are out. It's more quiet. And that's the, where you, know, you can have more reflection, more understanding because of, because of this. That is the wisdom behind the Prophet ﷺ getting together with Jibreel السلام, in the middle of the night. That's why in Surah Al Muzammil, Allah says, Inna nashi at al layli hi ashaddu wata'an wa aqwa muqila. Inna laka fi nahari sabhan tawila. In uh, Surah Al Muzammil, that, that recommends Qiyamul Layl, mentions that the night is more powerful as an influence on your heart. Wa aqwa muqila makes you more firm. So these are the great lessons of this hadith, being in good times, being in good places, in the company of good people, having good worship, and just overall generosity of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So that's the hadith number six. One more hadith left, which we'll do to tomorrow, inshallah, close off the class. Um, before I open the floor for questions, just we have a surprise for tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to do something different. Uh, tomorrow is the ninth of Ashura, and Friday is Yom Ashura, which uh, everyone should be fasting. So it's a tradition. The Prophet Wasallam, he said, if I was alive, I would fast the ninth and the tenth, or the tenth and the eleventh. So many people fast on the ninth. Tomorrow is the ninth. So our class it happens during Maghrib time. So some of the students will be fasting. So we'll break fast together here. We'll have dinner. We'll celebrate the end of the class as well. So tomorrow there's a lot to do. So tomorrow we're going to begin at 8 o'clock sharp. We'll go till 8.30 or so. We'll break our fast um, with dates. We'll have dates here. Break the fast. And 8.30 we'll break. We'll pray Maghrib. We'll have dinner uh, in the next room. And then we'll come back and finish the hadith. Inshallah. So again, that's the reminder for tomorrow. Hadith is fairly long tomorrow. So... I don't know. <laughs> Three pages? Wow. For you, for you. Okay, any questions? Anyone online have questions? You can type them or ask. What is generosity? Okay, read it to us. Use the mic. Where's the mic? Happy to give. Okay, someone who's excessive in giving and happy to give. Oh yeah, Jawada. So it's 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 related to the word. Is it the exact same word? Yeah, yeah, it is. I think I think it is from the same root. Which means that in, that means in terms of recitation, it means that it's like. Um, well, the meaning is not generosity there. From that's from to perfect, but but it's related. So if you want to do a deeper phil philological or linguistic, you know, dive, then you see, because words that have, that are related from the same roots, they have a relation in the meaning. So there's a sense there. But you can't say tajweed means generosity, like being generous with the Quran, but better but to I mean, say it's related to the word for generosity. The recitation itself is, is more fuller, isn't it? Isn't it? Doesn't it have a more fuller? May Allah no, yeah. no, but, I mean, what does the word in terms of recitation <laughs> What does it mean? Yeah, in terms of when you say he read it in Jawi, oh yeah, yeah. When you, when you hear that recitation, it has a certain flavor to it, as opposed. Oh, to I see, I see. Yeah. So, so like the the contemporary usage of tajweed is like adornment, like making something more embellished. So, Mujawad Quran is something that's even more special, more beautiful, like has more emotion in it. 
Um, but the classical tajweed means perfect the huruf, tajweed al huruf, ma'arif, ma'arifat al wuquf. Yes. So just grab that. Yeah. Keep it on. Yeah. Kind of on a similar vein, but the last word there, uh -huh. um, Mursala, any relationship to the word Mursal? Yeah. Mursala means the wind that is sent, flowing, irsal. Yurusil or Riyaha. Allah sends the winds and Allah sends the messenger. Same word. Same in Yurusil or uh, Riyaha. Uh, and then Arsala Rasula Hubil Huda. Exact same word. Exact same word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. about? Um, what, 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 what does it actually stand oh, for? So it stands for Tahwil. Tahwil means to convert. Hawala, like to switch, actually to switch. So it's switching to a different Islam, basically. So it's a summary for tahweed. So when you read it in hadith, when you're reading, it will say ha. That's how you read it, just by say the name of the letter, ha, and then you switch to a different Islam. It's ha or tahweed. Yes, brother. Let's grab the mic if you don't mind. We have online students that can't hear. The Prophet said the most Edward means like more giving and more generous and, and in in that moment in Ramadan, he said he was sleeping less. How were the ulama in that time like able? What was the key factor for them to to manage time? He said, "Would they like specific time to sleep just after Isha and wake up late?" And what's the key element of being exhausted during the whole week? So what's the seeker behind a good schedule in Ramadan? Is that what I'm hearing from? <laughs> yeah, that's a million dollar question, right? I haven't been able to solve that problem. Um, it's the key. There are many, there are many things there. Like, so overall there's, there's more barakah in things. The barakah comes from not only your effort, but there's also things outside of your effort that the barakah come. There's some days like you're reading a book and you're able to read like five chapters, understand and do a whole bunch of things that day. And there are other days you're stuck on the same page for like a couple of days straight. And even though you have the same time, the same schedule. So it's not just a schedule. There's like these hidden factors there. There's barakah that comes from Allah Azza wa Jal. Um, so we have to tap into the barakah of Allah. But also you have to work on your schedule. Though the schedule, part of the schedule and the logistical things you do is you need to sleep during the night, um, but you also need to get something accomplished at night. So how do you get a full night's rest and do tahajjud and qiyamul layl? So the only way you can do that is if you sleep during the day, the qaylula. So that was a big secret of the early ulama and even many other cultures around the world. You have siestas, the, the afternoon nap. If you take like a half hour to like under one hour nap in the middle of the day, recharges you and you get much more out of the day and the rest of the day. And then you can even get up at night if you make that. So these early scholars, they used to sleep for short periods of time. So they knew how to perfect that. It wasn't like you're sleeping 10 hours straight like we do or eight hours straight. Because um, that is, you know, um, don't ask how many hours my kids sleep. But like, it's incredible. Like, because the, the more you sleep, the prolonged time, it kills your day. Then you're not productive anymore because now you, you pass that critical threshold. So sleep is very important, how to sleep. So the Prophet ﷺ, he would lie down after the sunnahs of Fajr, there's a hadith. So like in, he took these key moments just to rest, charge himself lightly. So there was light sleep, there was deep sleep. Um, and then there are things that you do. You know, you have to know how to manage your time. You have to know how to do things efficiently. You have to do things with productivity. You have to know how to do things with less effort. That takes a lot of planning and logistical planning. That's a huge question, but at the end of the day, it's your effort plus asking the barakah of Allah. That's why when you wake up in the morning, one of the secrets of asking for the productivity is, what's the door of the morning? You wake up. Allah meaning, as'aluka khayra hadhal yawm, fathahu wa nurahu wa barakatahu wa nasrahu. Yeah. So Allah give me the good of this day, the victories of this day, and the, the help of this day. I mean, you're asking for a good day, a pro, pro, productive day. You want a day full of productivity and 
barakah and victories. So when you ask Allah that in the morning and you have that mindset when Allah gives, Allahu Akbar. Okay, so based on this hadith, right? Is it can you just infer? So part of it is starting with Prophet Muhammad Sallam, so I can understand those are the words of Ibn Abbas Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's a part where he's actually describing something the Prophet Muhammad Sallam did, right? Mm -hmm. So, but he doesn't say that I heard the Prophet Muhammad Sallam say this. So can you just infer that he heard this from the Prophet Muhammad Sallam directly? Yeah, so it's not a statement of the Prophet, right? So, so it's an action. So there's nothing the Prophet is saying with his tongue. So that's why there's no qala Rasulullah Sallam. But it's a, it's a description of the Prophet. But he's saying that Prophet like, Muhammad Sallam might be here every night. Yeah, so it's a description, right? So, so the first part is obviously you must have been informed that. Obviously, when you say obviously, is that can we infer from this that he heard from God from directly, or maybe through another companion? Or? Yeah, either directly through another companion, for sure. He got it from somewhere. So, so when 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 the companions relate some information about the Prophet Sallallahu either they witness it directly, or they heard it from another companion, but. When you get to a companion level, you don't think about these things. That's the thing. Like every level you look at, okay, did you hear this from that person? You... Once you get to the Sahaba, so that's that's what the scholars say. Once the Sahaba are untouchable in terms of their trustworthiness of the pro from the Prophet. So, so. If they're saying something from the Prophet, we trust it. Now you don't investigate, okay, Ibn Abbas, did he see him? Where did he get it from? So scholars did not look at that. And the fact is, majority of Sahaba, they're relating from each other. So... Um, we don't know. Ibn Abbas was very young when the Prophet ﷺ passed, so he only witnessed his latter portion of his life in Medina. So, and he relates so many hadith. He's one of the prolific narrators of hadith. That means the majority of his hadith he's learning from other companions. Um, but like something like this is piecing together something about the Prophet's life. So, obviously, the Prophet was teaching his companions and telling them about the revelation coming during the night. In Ramadan, you're connected to the Prophet So they probably saw many things as well. So Kana Ajwa Dunas, that's their first hand experience. And uh, every night of Jibreel, that must have been from the Prophet, either directly or through another companion. But it doesn't matter for us, they're both avenues would be equally valid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this particular hadith is talking about the um, generosity of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, I mean, there are other descriptions, so it's not a complete description of the Prophet. So, you know, it's not meant to be a final description of the Prophet ﷺ. Every companion is relating different things about the Prophet. So there's another version of this hadith, كَانَ أَجْوَ النَّاسِ وَكَانَ أَشْجَعَ النَّاسِ He was the most generous of people and the most courageous of people. Um, so everyone's describing different aspects of the prophetic uh, life, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yeah, so for Ibn Abbas, certainly it was important. He's connecting generosity with Ramadan, and and he's connecting, uh, you know, Ramadan with the generosity, vice versa, and with the Quran. And so maybe there's a deeper lesson here: generosity is connected to Quran. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. Yes. One of the important factors is just kind of your um, was this a source of habitual was a habitual action that goes on. Um, yeah. Um, and it wasn't it just wasn't it in this it was habitual that he, he used to always do it. Yeah. So I mean there's the whole thing Kana Yalkahu Kulalayla he used to meet him every night. That's habitual. And then Kana Yudari Sul Quran, there was an exchange learning of Quran. So that means it was a strong relationship. It wasn't one time, one day, but it's like every night. Can you imagine? Every single night meeting Jibreel <laughs> in Ramadan. It must have been an incredible experience. Any sisters? Online, I don't see. Okay, inshallah, um, we'll end with that. Fatahallahu uh, alaykum, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته